Hi, welcome to another edition of Hub Bytes. I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist from PsychScene. Today I'll be taking you through the evaluation of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. To set the scene, I received a referral from a physician approximately three days ago. Um, it was a 42 year old female. It was for an evaluation for ADHD. Now, one of the things we've got to think about is if I went ahead and basically carried out an ADHD adult self-report scale or CADRA questionnaire or DIVA 2.0 and I identified attention, concentration deficits, hyperactivity and impulsivity, I could basically say this is, a, this is ADHD. But the question is, what if there are several other underlying things that might be contributing to these symptoms? It's possible that could result in a misdiagnosis. So that's really the aim of this video, is to outline that the evaluation of ADHD, one, ADHD is a diagnosis of exclusion. Two, we should think about ADHD from a longitudinal perspective and to look at several other factors that might be contributing to these deficits. And the reason why I think about it that way is because, let's imagine this was a bridge and you as an individual are crossing the bridge on a daily basis. And if the individual has ADHD, they're doing that, they've been prescribed a stimulant and they're going okay. But what if there are several underlying factors that are making this bridge weaker? That is, there are vulnerabilities. These factors act as vulnerabilities. And at some point, this bridge cracks and breaks. That's when the patient comes to you and says, doctor, the medication isn't working. They might present with depression, they might present with anxiety, they might, they might present with a range of other disorders. So the really important aspect is to think about these vulnerabilities and address these vulnerabilities as well because every little thing counts. And it's important that the cumulative effect of all these things that we've addressed results in a beneficial outcome. And this is linked to the basis of psychiatric formulation and management. I've covered this in another video on the channel, so please, please do have a listen to it as well. We've also covered it in, uh, on the psychscenehub.com as an article. So really we're following the Sherlock Holmes way of thinking, deductive reasoning, and not succumbing to confirmatory bias. So let's get started with the evaluation. But as always, before getting into the details, it's important that this is not to be construed as medical advice. Any personal issues should always be discussed with your own doctor. So the first thing I think about is the organic aspects. What does that mean? The medical aspects. Now this hierarchy has been covered in more detail on another video, the psychotic formulation management video on the channel. So please do have a listen to that one as well. So we in the organic section, a few things that I think about firstly, now this particular patient was diagnosed with moderate sleep apnea. Now sleep apnea and sleep difficulties can impact significantly on cognition during the day. So we know that ADHD is, can be considered really a disorder of cognition as well because it has attention, concentration issues, other cognitive um, issues as well that one identifies. So sure, cognition is a faculty right at the top that we think about, but obstructive sleep apnea because of hypoxia during the night, the individual can wake up really unrefreshed, fatigue, which impacts on concentration and attention during the day. So obstructive sleep apnea is one of the factors to take into account. The other aspects are vascular factors, diabetes, hypertension, and we know that vascular factors can result in white matter hyperintensities of the brain and white matter hyperintensities are associated with cognitive deficits. So it's important to be proactive in treating those as well. Now, of course, in some cases, it is important to carry out an actual frontal lobe cognitive examination, but other cognitive examinations such as a clock drawing test. And if there are abnormalities identified, going into more detail, because in some rare cases, it is not uncommon to identify a neurodegenerative condition that might present as ADHD, such as frontotemporal dementias, because we know that frontal lobe is a predominant part of the brain that's involved in ADHD. So the point is, it is important to carry out a thorough cognitive examination in individuals with ADHD, not just the ADHD self-report scale of focusing on attention, concentration, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. 
Then we also look at other aspects such as vitamin B12, folate deficiencies, vitamin D deficiencies. Why do we look at that? Because we know that these are involved in the methylation pathway, the first two, and are necessary for the production of noradrenaline, dopamine, two key neurotransmitters that are involved in the neurobiology of ADHD. Now, this particular patient that was referred to me had elevated ANA, elevated DSDNA. The anti-ENA was normal, but their ESR was elevated as well. So that brings in the inflammatory hypothesis. We know that when neuroinflammation is present or systemic inflammation is present, individuals can present with significant cognitive disturbances. And the other important aspect of inflammation is there is an overlap between fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and cognitive deficits as part of these particular syndromes. So we know that the inf inflammation, neuroinflammation, and systemic inflammation can result in fibromyalgia type um, syndromes, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, and we know that cognition is a core feature of these conditions. So we often see this triad together. So it's important to think about inflammation as well. The other aspect to think about is thyroid functions and also iron because these deficiencies can present with significant cognitive issues as well. In females, um, you know, this 42-year-old female, I would also be thinking about polycystic ovarian syndrome. Why? Because estrogen and abnormalities in estrogen, we know that estrogen is very, very crucial for cognition. So sometimes in the perimenopausal, postmenopausal group, we can see symptoms that are very, very suggestive or can be diagnosed as ADHD onset late, but much of this can be due to estrogen deficiency, for example, impacting on cognition. So it's crucial that the hormonal aspect is also evaluated. So that's sort of the, the, the organic evaluation. Then we think about substances, and here we think about substance misuse. So for example, excessive alcohol use or cannabis use or other illicit substances. And the reason why that's important is because these substances can impact on the subcortical area, the basal ganglia and the connections to the frontal lobe, the same pathways that can be involved in ADHD. You can have a, a more detailed read of the neurobiology of ADHD, which we covered in the psychscenehub.com. We've also covered the diagnosis and management of ADHD with a focus on adult ADHD. So do have a read of that one as well. With substances, we've also got to think about any medications that have been prescribed by um, physicians or psychiatrists because certain medications can impact on cognition. The next aspect we think about is psychotic Spectrum. And when I think about psychotic spectrum, it's not just about psychosis in the form of delusions and hallucinations, but really we're thinking about the mesolimbic pathway. And if the mesolimbic pathway is activated, it results in hyperarousal symptoms, heightened emotional reactivity, racing thoughts. And we know that these symptoms can impact, impact on cognition, so the functioning during the day, but it can also impact on sleep, resulting in middle insomnia, early um, insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, or early morning wakening, all of which can impact on cognitive functioning during the day and can look like ADHD. So it is important to address any mixed features, but the other aspect that's important in psychotic spectrum is a thorough evaluation of ruling out psychotic disorders by taking a family history, looking at the genetic um, aspects, because individuals with prodromal psychosis can have neurodevelopmental abnormalities. So developmental delay, for example, or attention concentration problems, learning difficulty in school, etc. And much of this can, one can fall in the trap of misdiagnosis. They can be prescribed a stimulant and it can result in a psychotic episode. So it's really, really important to rule out underlying vulnerabilities towards psychosis to avoid misdiagnosis and uh, a, a prescription of a stimulant that could result in detrimental sort of consequences. The next one is the affective syndrome. And here really, one's focusing on ruling out the severe forms of depression. Um, for example, melancholic type depressions that have dopamine and noradrenaline as key underpinnings in the genesis. So we're looking at, you know, dopamine, noradrenaline sort of abnormalities, melancholic depression, because we know that in melancholic depression, decision-making, attention concentration issues, cognitive issues are a core feature. Of course, ADHD and depression can be comorbid and both need to be treated. And the reason why that can happen, particularly in adulthood, is that 
They might initially have ADHD, but because of difficulty coping through life, it's resulted in lots of losses, it's resulted in difficulty coping, and it's resulted in additional sort of depressive elements being added on top of the ADHD. So that's where the comorbidity comes in. Moving lower down, we think about trauma. Now with particular trauma, we think about past trauma during childhood. And why is this important? Because trauma impacts on the neurodevelopment, the development of the brain, and can result in not only cognitive issues, but also impulse dysregulation and impact on emotional dysregulation. So trauma and looking at those aspects is important. We know that trauma can also result in ongoing heightened sympathetic drive. So therefore hyperarousal can be present. So it's linked to mixed features as well. But we know that trauma is also linked to fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. So we see this complex picture of trauma, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome impacting on cognition, but also many individuals with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome have mixed features. So one's really got to think about deconstructing the problem and addressing each one rather than trying to search for a single diagnosis. So trauma is really important, but of course we look at current stresses as well because current stresses when added on to an underlying vulnerability can result in worsening of cognitive status. Next we look at OCD. They can often be OCD comorbid. I have seen cases of resistant OCD that actually were treated, that act Uh, had a diagnosis of ADHD and responded very well to, well to stimulants. Why does that happen? It happens because in OCD, one of the neurotransmitters that's involved is dopamine. So you can have a read of the neurobiology of OCD as well in detail in the psych scene hub. So in resistant cases, one's got to think about the possibility of ADHD. And many individuals with adult ADHD can have severe procrastination as a key feature. The other aspect is anxiety. Now, this is really crucial because we know that in childhood, hyperactivity is a symptom, but only 30% of individuals sort of move to have hyperactivity as a symptom in adulthood. So a lot of the hyperactivity dissipates the external hyperactivity, but sometimes the internal hyperactivity remains, and this can present as internal agitation or internal anxiety. So sometimes in resistant anxiety disorders, it's worth thinking about the possibility of ADHD. But the other aspect with anxiety is that we know that sometimes when a stimulant is prescribed, it can actually worsen anxiety. So a thorough evaluation of the possibility of hyperarousal needs to be taken into account in ADHD. And hyperarousal is linked to, as we saw, mixed features, but also anxiety. So if there is significant hyperarousal, then one can actually combine the stimulant to treat the cognitive elements uh, of, of sort of the frontal lobe aspects, noradrenaline, dopamine, by using a stimulant, but then treating the hyperarousal during other periods or the side effects by considering clonidine or guanfacine, which is an alpha-2 agonist. Um, but it's important, of course, co any combination therapy should be a specialist treatment. As far as possible, we try to avoid Uh, combination therapies um, because we want to ensure that we prescribe one medication. But again, these are things that need to be discussed. They're individualized treatments. But just to outline that in some cases, um, reduction of hyperarousal is absolutely crucial because there are two elements going on. And I'll come to that in a sec when I talk about sleep. Uh, of course, it's important to think that individuals with eating disorder can also have ADHD type symptomatology. But of course, then prescription of stimulants, one's got to be very, very cautious because they drop appetite. We know that uh, personality, there may be certain personality traits that can sort of be associated with ADHD, but when there's lots going on here, I'm not going to jump to the diagnosis of a personality disorder, but high levels of perfectionism, sort of anancastic personality, obsessive compulsive personalities can sometimes, of course, add on that extra stress for an individual with ADHD. And one of the important things that I want to touch on is sleep. A very, very large proportion of individuals tend to have sleep disturbances. Individuals with ADHD have sleep disturbances. We touched on obstructive sleep apnea, which is important to address, but circadian rhythm disturbance is very crucial as well. You can have a listen to the neurobiology of sleep video that I did on this channel to really think about what is hyperarousal and what are circadian rhythms and how they impact on, on sleep. 
Now, when there is significant hyperarousal at nighttime, it can sort of present with vivid dreams, difficulty falling asleep, waking up several times in the middle of the night, early morning wakening, etc. Now, this can impact significantly on cognition during the day because the individual wakes up unrefreshed and extended periods of hyperarousal and sleep difficulties impact on cognition. So there is good evidence that sleep disturbances impact on cognition. Therefore, it becomes important in some cases, simply addressing sleep by good sleep hygiene may actually improve cognitive function. So that is one of the important things to take into account as part of management, not just simply prescribing a stimulant, because if there's ongoing sleep difficulties, the stimulants might stop working. And in many cases, to address the um, hyperarousal at nighttime, circadian rhythm disturbances, that's where clonidine and guanfacin may be utilized because they reduce that heightened sympathetic overdrive, heightened noradrenaline at nighttime and assist in sleep, um, treat the, the vivid dreams of the nightmares and improve daytime functioning. So in some cases, a combination might be required where treating the hyperarousal at nighttime but, and improving cognition during the day might be required. But as I mentioned earlier, that's really, really individualized. And, you know, sleep's important. And of course, diet is also important. And of course, in children and adolescents, the link between dietary interventions and ADHD is something that is considered um, and it's something to take into account. Similarly, in adults as well, a healthy diet becomes very, very important. So the purpose of this interview is to highlight that it's important to carry out a thorough evaluation when presented with an ADHD type picture. The reason is because we want to ensure that these vulnerabilities are treated before jumping into the diagnosis of ADHD. So ADHD is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's important to run through the hierarchy of proper, thorough, deductive reasoning because when we rule out the impossible, what must remain is as close to the truth as possible. So I hope that you found this video useful. If you've liked it, please, of course, click the like button, subscribe to the channel. I look forward to seeing you in another edition of Hub Bites. Take care and stay safe.